Computer Programming with Elmer Steve Ochaeta. I will give you a little background of myself so that you can get to know me. I am the oldest of three brothers, all of whom have some level of programming experience. This photograph that you see was taken several years ago and it was during the time my brothers and I would get together to write some code to either finish a project for a customer or just to try to hack something. In the forefront is Hiram. He has a master's degree in economics and finance. Currently he uh, works in a distribution company, but he started in his high school days learning everything he could on computers. He did from computer repairs, uh, networking, cell phone repairs, computer graphics, etc. When he went to junior college, he um, obtained an associate's degree in networking and systems administrator. Jeff is in the middle. He has a uh, bachelor's in statistics. He graduated from the University of South Florida, just like I did. He also worked with me in the IT field for several years. In his junior college, he did mathematics and uh, computer science. So, but he now is more into data science, analytics, all of that. I am in the background. I graduated magna cum laude in 2002 from the University of South Florida. Graduated in computer engineering. I have several years of experience working in IT, also in automation. Uh, working as a programmer also in, in both areas, in the automation um, and also in information technology in different sectors such as banking, government, um, beverage and distribution, sales, and in different areas. And also in automation, I've worked in, in factories from the production of beverages to another consumer goods to the production of um, uh, pipes for the oil industry. So I work on that in different SCADA machines. Also, I've taught in computer courses uh, from high school, junior college, and even a business analytics course at the master's degree level. And of course, I like programming and I like to teach. So hopefully this will will be a very interesting course. Like I mentioned, I've uh, several years of experience. I've worked with the different tools, different vendor specific tools. I have taken many courses to uh, better learn different tools. I have worked with different information systems, different databases. I have worked in different cities in Caribbean, Mexico and the United States for different customers. This is a more recent picture of myself. Here I am at the Android LAN. Uh, you see me by this Android uh, robot, this green robot, which is in a trip that I did to Googleplex, the Google Complex in Mountain View, California. In this course, I won't teach you anything about Android development, but rather I'll teach you C++. In turn, you will be able to learn any programming language, I believe, fairly easy. There's no need to be afraid of computer programming. In my opinion, everybody or anybody can learn computer programming. And this course is exactly for that. It is for everybody or anybody who wants to learn computer programming. But the the software um, that we will be using is quite easy to understand. I will explain to you more of that later on. And the language C++, it's an introductory level that we will, will be teaching. The reason I say that anybody can learn programming is because I believe that now everybody has the capability and the opportunity to do so from a little kid to an older adult 
Before I start to really talk about computer programming, let me show you this picture. This is a picture I took at, in Mountain View, California of the Computer History Museum. This museum is dedicated to preserving and presenting the stories and artifacts of the information age. They look at the compute, computing revolution, the impact it has done in history, the impact it's doing now in society. When I was there, I looked at a definition of a computer. If I ask you what's a computer, you probably will immediately think on a laptop. Maybe you'll think about a tablet or your smartphone. But before we go into electronic computers, there was notion of human computers. And here you see a picture that I took on the right hand side in exactly this museum. And on the left, you see the enhanced picture. You see a lot of women working. This was in the area of uh, post uh, Second World War when the, the Social Security Act, they provided the benefits for many Americans there was a lot of people that had to work and they had to work in specific procedures specific instructions and perform specific calculations sometimes they would use a calculating machine and on the right you see the different machines from a sorter a, a punch card reader a punch card machine itself these were created by IBM because when the Social Security Act came into being, there was a lot of calculations that had to be done for many millions of Americans. Hence, before we had those electronic computers, a, the definition of a computer would be someone, which would be an individual, that would be performing calculations. Therefore, anybody can do computing because a computer in itself follows specific instructions and performs specific calculations. Of course, the computers have become more generalized and they are general purpose computers. In the picture that you see, these machines, they were specific. They would be, they would read the punch cards which were what hold the data numeric data and the alphanumeric data let's say because it holds the names and it represented also dates uh, wages and social security information there was a machine that would sort it there was a machine that would take those and put it in, in appropriate um, batches and there was a machine that would punch the punch cards but they were specific to that so who can become a programmer well the answer again I keep repeating is anybody and everybody I borrowed this infographic from Mark Vital and this represents the nine types of intelligence that were described around 1983 by American developmental psychologist Howard Gardner. He thought that intelligence was not just mathematical intelligence or logical intelligence, but there were in reality, according to him, other intelligence, such as musical intelligence, linguistic intelligence. And let me tell you the truth, many persons that are very good in mathematics and logic are not very good musicians and very good musicians might probably not be very good linguistic people and what about the relationship the interpersonal relationship Gardner he believed that that was an intelligence understanding your surrounding knowing where you're living naturalist intelligence or being able to to coordinate your mind with your body that was also an intelligence that he described or just being just knowing who you are 
why we live or why we die all of that was described so in reality everybody has level of intelligence and being intelligent people being reasonable people then we can go into computing and we can go into programming if I back, <clears throat> my own definition of computing you can see this uh, URL and there is an article I put in the LinkedIn where I define computing and this was when I uh, my son asked me dad what is computing because I had told him that I was going to teach him computing and I told him son you know what I will tell you what's the definition of computing and this would be without looking at Google or going to Wikipedia or going into a online definition from a online encyclopedia I just told him so imagine if you have to cross a river in a canoe and you have to take with you three things a sack of corn a pig and a tiger and then the canoe can only take you and one of the items when you are present the tiger does not eat the pig but if you leave the tiger alone of course the the, the tiger and the pig together when you come back you won't see the pig the tiger would have eaten the pig now if you will leave the sack of corn and the pig well the pig would eat the corn so you wouldn't have that item so i asked my son how would you resolve this well he started to give me a definition of how he would do it logically and i told him son that is computing therefore now let's go into a little bit more on talk about programming languages but before we start to talk about c plus plus code and syntax i have here flow of programming languages and this is more some history for you to know at the beginning of time programmers only saw numeric machine code which was zeros and ones imagine trying to write zeros and ones this was very specific to the hardware that they were working on it was the lowest level of programming language but it is very difficult to understand it requires uh, a lot of time so people started to develop develop different programming languages assembly language was developed with the idea to help the programmers save time and memory because they wouldn't have to remember physically where specific instruction was in the computer so Assembly language uses mnemonic to represent low-level code or instructions. There is an assembler that converts this code into machine code. Later on, speed coding was introduced. And this was introduced by IBM. It was the first high-level programming languages, which was easier to understand, saved a lot of time. After that, Algol, or what was called algorithmic language, was developed around 1950. And of course, it helped to for, uh, influence other programming languages such as Fortran, which was Formula Translator and was mainly used for calculations and numeric computation. Also, this was created by IBM. Algol introduced code blocks and had different flavors, one of which was Algol 60, short for Algorithmic Language of 1960. It was then used mostly by research computer scientists both in Europe and the United States. They worked together to enhance this language. And algorithms, just that, so that we can debate a little bit, 
is something that everybody was used to. For example, if you would decide what, what color of shirt to use in the morning, you would wake up, probably think what day it was, setting a condition. Based on the condition, you would probably say, oh, it's time to go to work. So I would probably use a professional attire and you would select one of the, the shorts that you have and you would wear that. So algorithms, uh, algorithm language was very easy to understand. And uh, people started to work and enhance on this, especially uh, European and United States computer scientists that work together. And together they produce a, a programming language called the Combined Programming Language, or CPL, which was influenced from this algo of 1960. This Combined Programming Language was a multi-paradigm programming language that was developed also around 1960 and it was the early ancestor of C, the language that influenced C++. From CPL, there were BCPL, which was a basic combined programming language, or also people would call it before C programming language, which is just a, a humorous backronym for our CPBL, BCPL, sorry. It's a, it introduced procedures, it was an imperative and structured computer programming language, and it was intended to write in compilers for other languages. BCPL now is, is of course, is no longer in, in use. However, it influenced, is felt because it changed uh, to something called B, and B language was the language on which C programming language was based. Of course, after B comes C. So the enhancements that were made to B was what C came to. And C was, in reality, the first modern programming language with um, a lot of um, success, let's call it. B was um, developed in Bell Labs in 1969, and it was the work of Thompson and Dennis Ritchie. They were working on B uh, because they were working on a language for their operating system called Multics, which we could say is a precursor of Unix. C was then developed by them also to work on what would be the Unix operating system. Um, so Dennis Ritchie worked uh, around the 1970 or late 1969 to 1973 to develop C. And this was the enhancement of B. He was working still at Bell Labs and they were working to implement the Unix operating, Unix operating system. And like I said, C has been one of the most widely used programming language of the time. There were uh, many standardizations that took place. For example, American National Standards Institute in 1989, and then the International Organization uh, for Standardization, ISO, in 1979. They they um or oh, sorry after they started to work on that in standardization of c just to mention unix um there are many many unix like software um i think the most uh used right now is the apple os or the mac os which has certifications because now Unix has evolved uh, Unix.org as a certification organization. There are uh, other operating systems that were unlike Unix and uh, for example MS-DOS from Microsoft which was uh, not a multi-user 
system, but just a single user system. That's how it started. But anyway, that's how C was introduced when they were working to develop Unix. So you see a lot of uh, operating systems that are built in C and uh, based on C as well, and a lot of operating systems that are based on the Unix operating system. In 1979, a Danish computer scientist Carl Bjarne through he began to work on an enhancement of C with classes. So this was called C with classes, and the idea was um, that he wanted to create something that would be based on his experience and his PhD studies that would help uh, software development. So he started to work on that, but it was too slow for practical use. And um, so when he started to work at AT&T Bell Labs, he couldn't analyze the Unix kernel with the distributed computing, so he started to enhance C, which was the language that was used to develop C++, um, Unix, sorry, and he started to add classes, and that's where the C with classes became C++. So that's a little bit of history of how C++ have arrived. Of course, C influenced many other languages, and C++ influenced other languages as well. One of the languages it influenced is C Sharp and Java. C Sharp um, is developed by Microsoft and Java is developed by Sun Microsystems. Sometimes there is a confusion about how these two languages relate to C++. So let me give you a brief discussion of their relationship in regards to C++. So in this graph you would see C influencing C++ and C++ which was started as an enhancement of C with classes, because C doesn't have classes, was what influenced the creation of C Sharp and Java. Therefore, C++ can be said to be the parent of both Java and C Sharp. Although both Java and C Sharp have added or removed or modified different features, but the syntax of these are quite similar. And we can say nearly identical. Therefore, if you learn C++, you'll be able to understand C Sharp and Java quite easily. The look and feel of this language, like I said, is very similar. So it is easy for any programmer to go from C++ to C Sharp and Java and understand the code. The idea or the difference or the reason why C Sharp and Java were created is because they were created with the idea of being cross-platform, meaning that they would be portable. In regards to C++, you cannot have a program that be portable. It is, once it's executed, the object code produced by the compiler is specific to the machine code. Therefore, it only wor works in a specific hardware. Java and C Sharp, they were intended to be portable, and when they're compiled, the program does not go straight into machine code, but goes into something that's called a pseudocode, or an intermediate language. In the case of Java, this language is called bytecode. In the case of C Sharp, it's called a Microsoft Intermediate Language, or MSIL. In both cases, the pseudocode is executed by a runtime environment. Therefore, for you to run Java, the Java runtime has to be installed, and this Java runtime is called a Java Virtual Machine. In the case of C Sharp, for you to be able to execute this program, 
you have to have the common language runtime. So if you don't have either the CLR common language runtime from Microsoft implemented or the Java virtual machine, you won't be able to, to run these programs. But this this um, and um, frameworks, the Java virtual machine and the Microsoft language runtime can be installed in different systems and once you write your program in Java or C sharp you could you could um, be able to run them and those that's how those languages achieve portability having said that um, it's very important that we understand that C++ is not C rather C++ has classes and this is um, the essence of C++ and of course Java and C Sharp which are influenced by C++ object oriented programming languages such as C++ have three traits in common the encapsulation polymorphism and inheritance encapsulation is a programming mechanism that binds together code and data together. So the idea is that it's kept safe from outside an interface and the misuse. In object-oriented languages, the code and data can be bound together in such a way that a self-contained block box is created. And then within the box, there are answer data and code. When the code and data are linked together in this fashion, the object is created. In other words, an object is the device that supports encapsulation. So, object-oriented programming, encapsulation is very important. This term is where the data is linked with the code necessary for an object to be created and I'll explain this more later on and this object can be private or public private mean the data is not accessible but public it is accessible within the program anything outside that object once it's called. The basic unit of encapsulation is called a class and the idea of class is that defines an object. Both the data and the code that are operated on that data. Objects are instances of a class therefore. And a class is essentially a set of plans on how to build an object. So that's another term. The code and the data of a class are the members of the class. Um, if you have a variable, this is called a member variable of the class, uh, or also an instance variable, and the data defined by the class, the member functions are the code that operate on that data. Another uh, important term is polymorphism. The word polymorphism by itself means having many forms and in, in code, uh, programming language, object-oriented programming language, it refers to being able to, to have uh, a function uh, that operates uh, in many forms. In other words, different meanings of that functions. And then the other term is inheritance. And inheritance is a process by which an object, of which we said the, the basic uh, uh, object created by encapsulation is a class. So inheritance is where that object or that class would acquire the properties of another object on which it is based. For example, if we have a 
a hierarchical classification and we think about something like an apple we can say a red apple is part of a classification of apples which in turn of classification of fruits which is of a class food and so on so this is inheritance we will go a little bit more into detail later on when we start to to review object oriented programming in C++ but it just made sense in the meantime to to understand these terms that will be used later on and explain it in more detail so now we go in to looking at some code but before we go and look at some code it is essential that we understand what is required well you need a computer of course and you need a compiler to be able to execute programs that you develop in C++ and um, before you look at the code the easiest way for anybody to compile a C++ program is by using an integrated development environment or IDE. IDE is, they generally integrate the development tools including the text editors where you will write the code and any tool that is required to compile the programs. A uh, common IDE with full features is uh, uh, Microsoft Visual Studio Community Edition and it is free. Um, this free IDE Microsoft Visual Studio Community allows you to create modern applications for Windows but also for iOS, for Android as well as web applications and cloud services and it is available not just for Windows but you could install it in Mac OS as well anybody can use Visual Studio Community to create their own free uh, applications it's very flexible because it allows you to build on any platform it helps you enhance your productivity because it has designers, it has editors, it has debuggers in one single tool and uh, there are a lot of extensions that you could find in the ecosystem uh, of tools for this Visual Studio Community Edition and the languages that you can code in include C++ which we'll be using but of course C Sharp, Java, Script, Python, HTML and much more. So it's essential that you have this install on your computer visual studio community now let's look at the structure of a program typically when you're learning how to program the first program anybody would learn to write is called hello world which simply prints hello world on the computer screen although it's very simple uh, this contains the fundamental components of a C++ program. Here on the screen, you, you look at uh, seven lines of code, which represents uh, the syntax or the source code of this C++ program that prints Hello World, which you see on the right on the screen. The screen is in gray, and the, the blue represents the text editor line number one which has two slashes is high, is written in color green in this text editor which represents a line of comment or a comment line it, this tells the compiler hey jump this line it is not necessary but it helps the programmer because it introduces documentation that is important for the program the second line and this has code that includes information it tells the compiler i am including these references or these libraries or these header files in my code i will have objects 
I will have functions, I will have methods, I will have different classes that will be called from this include files. And then line 4 to line 7 is your main function. Um, line 5 and line 7 have curly brackets, that's how you start and close a function within C++. Then you have std, which represents a class, um, and you're using the function cout, which we'll learn later on, and the input output stream, and you're telling write hello world, or display hello world in the output stream. So this is the structure of our program. It is in seven lines. It is fairly easy to understand. Not only does the text editor help us, but the way we structure the program logically. We could have all written in main, curly bracket, std, cout, hello world, semicolon, close bracket in one single line, and the compiler would have understood the results would have been the same, such as what is on the right, but it would have been very hard to understand, especially if it was a very long program. So, structuring your program requires a little of artistic skills, in the sense that it has to be neat. Okay, Documentation is very important as well when you write your program. Now let's look at basic input and output in C++. C++ uses a convenient abstraction called streams, and uh, I basically, basically mentioned something about the output stream. But it performs just not only the output, but also input operations. Uh, in any media such as the screen, uh, for input the keyboard or a file, a stream is an entity where a program can either insert or extract characters to and from. There is no need to know details about the media associated to the stream or any of its internal specification. All we need to know is that the streams are source or destination of characters and that these characters are provided or accepted sequentially. That means one after another. The standard library uh, defines a handful of stream objects that can be used to access and um, we're going to see in more details only cout and cin which is the standard output and the standard input streams. What you see here uh, on your slide uh, cr also clog which are output streams and they are also um, essentially working similar to C out. The only difference is that they identify streams for specific purposes, and the purposes are error messages and logging. In many cases, most environment setups, they will actually do the exact same thing. They print on the screen, although they can also be redirected to print to a file or write to a file. So we'll look at the standard output first. By default, the, the output goes to the screen. So when we would normally write C out, the stream object defined to access it is C out. The operator that we see is two less than signs. In the example here, we are inserting the word output sentence, which is a string into the stream C out. The result was would be that this would be displayed on on the screen. 
on the second line we have inserted the number 120 and in the third line we have inserted the variable x it will take the value of that variable on the screen if you notice that the in the first line output sentence is in quotation because it is a string literal meaning whatever is within that quotation is what i actually want to display so if we would have an x like in the third line and have that with quotation mark it would print the literal x on the screen and not what is within x so that is very important for you to remember you can have multiple insertion operations also meaning uh, multiple uh, less than equals to chain a line together such as in this example where we're saying this is a single C++ statement with that you could imagine that you could integrate variables into the chain or a single statement. You could also insert a line break or a new line character. In the exact position, the line should be broken. And you do this by inserting a slash n, such as in this example, for sentence, slash n, which is a backslash character followed by a lowercase n. Or you could use the end L manipulator and it would break the line as well. The difference, uh, well, they do the same thing, the slash N and the end L, but the difference is that it affects your buffer streams. Meaning it flushes out the buffer which means that the output is requested to be physically written to the device if it wasn't already it would therefore take a little bit more time uh, to process but you would therefore use it only if you want to to um, to to clear the stream if not then you just use slash n <clears throat> the standard input by default would be the keyboard we saw the standard output being the screen the standard input is the keyboard and uh, we have here an example C in and the difference here is that it is written with two um, two greater than um, operators or two greater than signs this operator then is followed by the variable where the data is stored and in this example here we have a declaration of a variable called age of type in therefore what we're doing is accepting whatever we put in into the variable age this operation makes the program wait for input from scene which means that it will wait for the user to enter some sequence of data and it will put it into age now what if the user would not enter anything of type int? by default because we're inputting this data into age which was declared integer we would assume what comes in would be of that type 
the input stream would just be there, meaning the program would be just waiting for input from scene until the user would um, hit enter or the return key. Then that information from the keyboard would be transmitted to the program. If the user did not type anything that is of integer value, then an error will occur. This will be an unexpected error. Sometimes it would not run, sometimes it would allow the system to continue, but because the, the variable would not match the type of data that was entered, it would break or crash. Of course, this is a, is a poor program behavior because it's expected that a program behaves uh, in a user that it would be checking, checking or handling errors or invalid values appropriately and not crashing. So um, we wouldn't just accept a program accepting C in only if it's a simple program, but our other program it would be very important to to do further checking. And a little later we will see how string streams can be used to better control over the input of the user. Another example of using um, C in is allowing, for example, multiple values. In this case, where the, in, the user is expected to introduce two values, one for variable A and one for variable B. So the program would wait until those are entered. Here I have an example of get line. This function um, get line takes the stream C in as first argument and then the string variable as a second argument. So this is an example we are declaring a variable my string my str as type string and we're asking this is being displayed by C out on the screen, what is your name? And we're going through the input stream, the keyboard, and getting a line and storing it to the variable my stream. We have now seen two data types, which is string and int. Therefore, it's ideal that we talk more about data types. The values of variables are stored in some location in the computer memory as zeros and one. We don't need to make our program know exactly where that data is stored or exact location where this variable is stored, but simply we just need to call the variable by its name. Therefore, the program needs to be aware of what kind of data is stored in that variable. So with that, we have here a table that describes the different type of data. And these are the fundamental data types, or meaning the basic data types implemented directly by the language represent the basic storage units supported natively by most systems. It is classified into character types which represent a single character such as just the letter A or any other character. The most basic type is char which is only one byte character. 
Other types are also provided for wider characters. Numerical integer types. These store whole number values such as 1 and they exist in a variety of sizes and can either be signed or unsigned depending on whether they support negative values or not. The other type is floating point types. They can represent real values such as 3.14 with different levels of precision meaning it could have um, more digits, more decimal places depending on which uh, point type is used. The other type is Boolean, and Boolean type in C++ is known as Bool, B-O-O-L, and it represents one of two states, either true or false. You could read more on the, on the group type here on the table, the name, and some information on the positions or notes on the size on this table here on this screen. How do we declare a variable? We saw it on the examples before, but we have here in C++ um, the declaration of a variable. C++ is a strongly typed language, and uh, which means that you have to declare a variable before you could first use it. Other languages are more loosely uh, created, and you, once a variable is assigned a value, it automatically um, declares it, declares the type based on what assignment it's given. But here in C++, you have to declare a variable. And to declare a variable, you, the syntax is, is quite simple, it's very straightforward, you can see it. Simply write the type, then you write the variable name. For example, int a, int b, int c. In the example here, I have three variables, a, b, and c, out of type e, int. I could declare one by one in a line, or I could declare them sequentially in one line just following them by a comma as you see it there in the screen. Once the variables are declared the other step is to initialize the variable and the way you initialize a variable that has been declared is just assigning it a value. For example we have already def as, um, defined int as a variable a, sorry, as a variable of type int or integer, so we can initialize it as zero. If we don't initialize the variable, it can be any any value. You could initialize also a string, a variable string. by putting it into quotations and this is a value. Or you could classify, sorry, you could initialize a variable assigning it a value of another variable of the same type. 